Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online video series, Reading Hope in Trying Times. Our guest today is our wonderful friend, Barbara Brown Taylor. Barbara is a New York Times bestselling author, professor, and Episcopal priest. Her latest book is Holy Envy, Finding God in the Faith of Others. And if you haven't read that yet, I highly recommend it. Her first memoir, Leaving Church, won the Author of the Year Award from the Georgia Writers Association. Another book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, was featured in Time Magazine. She served in the faculty of Piedmont College as the Butman Professor of Religion and Philosophy and has been a guest lecturer at Emory, Duke, Princeton, and Yale, and I'm sure many other places as well. Barbara and her husband, Ed, live on a farm in the foothills of the Appalachians, sharing space with wild turkeys, red foxes, white-tailed deers, and far too many chickens. I'm also very happy to say that Barbara has served as a keynote speaker at many Writing for Your Life conferences. It's been an amazingly wonderful person to collaborate with. So very, very pleased to have her with us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I feel the same way about you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. So um, this whole pandemic has been affecting everyone differently. Um, how has it affected you and your family and your work? I'm sitting on my porch on 150 acres in the country, nine miles from the nearest town of 1,500 people. So social distancing is built into rural life, which means I haven't noticed much. I don't go to the grocery store. I'm staying home like everyone else. But it does mean I read the paper every morning, you know, start with the headlines so that I can stay in touch with how bad it is some other places. So I'm both appropriately sobered by the news and also unexpectedly inspired by all the ways people have found to encourage each other and stay in touch and do church and write and and even discover friendship and family and handwriting notes and things that we've forgotten about for a while so it's all going on at the same time well um, as, as you and I have talked many times I'm a, probably the more technology oriented of the two of us uh, yeah, this is the second time I've done this, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that, you know, you'll find some of this technology uh, even more useful than it was typically the case in the past. Hmm. Only for you, Brian. Only for you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the topics that we've been chatting uh, with folks about is really just, you know, how God's helped us through trying times in the past. Um, would you like to share some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm a writer, so I have to define all my terms first, right? But so God, G-D, is one big word. And I would say the way I'm most aware of God helping me is by um, inner resilience and love of other people and um, beautiful weather on the saddest of days. So when I talk about God, I don't ever think of a large person somewhere who's moving me around on a chessboard. Um, I think instead of the ways in which I've been made in the image of the creator to co-create and to um, till the soil and do my share of suffering and encouraging. So with, with all that in place, again, I, I don't have an idea of a, you know, a prime chess player. I have an idea of a Holy Spirit that enlivens me and enlivens people I love. So I especially paid attention to the title of this series you put together. And it, it does seem to me that hope is a fraught, huge word, not just for Christians, but for people of, of many, perhaps all different faiths. I've been reading a, a Buddhist teacher who freely talks about hope. Um, but hope can often be holding out for my desired results. You know, hope can be waiting for it to get back to the way I want it to be and believing that, that uh, God will get it there for me. <laughs> and instead, what has become super clear to me with death striking left and right and people who are the wrong age to be struck down by this virus is that hope has a lot more with um, finding a way to live faithfully in present circumstances, finding a way to respond within the given set of things and not, uh, I'm free to pray for miracles and they may happen, but it seems to me the greater, the greater miracle is waking up each day and saying, looks like this is how today is. So how could I live to my utmost today and how could I be there for people I love in ways that would give them hope, again, not in the sense of me rescuing, but in the sense of um, being present with and talking about things we don't talk about in regular okay times. So, so the great help has been uh, the compassion 
just all around me. 360 degree compassion seems to me to come straight from the heart of God. So if that's how God has been helping me, it's been helping. Though a friend died yesterday, not of COVID, but he died riding his bicycle, you know, and died of a stroke in minutes. So that happened yesterday. And today nobody has died so far that I know. But it, it hope, hope is waking up each day and surveying the present circumstances and the hope is that I will rise to meet the challenges of the moment and find a way to live fully within them. I give really long writer's answers. As you can tell, I'm terrible on radio. People say, wait, wait, that's enough. You can stop now. So <laughs> I'll just keep going till you put up a hand and say, stop, that's enough. <laughs> I won't ever ask you to stop. So that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, your words resonate so much to me because I've always felt like, you know, so much is dependent upon, you know, what are the hands we've been dealt? And what do we do with the hand we've been dealt and making the most, the most of that. And to me that, you know, that's where God helps me is just trying to react to whatever it is that, you know, we've been given. And, and right now we've been given, you know, some, everyone's using the word unprecedented and, and, and it's absolutely true. None of us, at least um, most of us have not uh, encountered things quite like this in terms of the pervasive nature of how this is affecting everyone um, across the world. So, um, you know, it's, all, it's new territory for all of us to, to figure out. And, uh, and what you're saying, you know, I, I just totally r relate to. Mm -hmm. And unprecedented, have I heard that word a lot uh, also. It helps me, oddly, to remember this is not unprecedented in the history of humankind, but we know about it in ways we've never known about it before. I mean, I even looked up the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, you know, just to see how people thought that was the end of the world. Much more wide, I mean, less widespread than this pandemic, but still just different times. World War I, you know, with the flu going on at the same time, Holocaust, you know, ways in which this kind of indiscriminate, uh, what, assault is, it comes out of nowhere, and, and it's nobody's fault. It's not, not punishment. I'll never go into that, that religious camp. But, um, but it helps sometimes to remember always to zoom the camera back and remember ways in which this is part of the human condition, and it always has been. It, and if anything, it's a wonderful reminder that we are not um, invincible. When this you know, uh, pandemic was, um, was first came to the United, the same thing, and I started looking up the Spanish flu and the plague oh. and you know what what happened then mm -hmm. what did people do how did it affect you know the world as it existed in those points of time because mm -hmm. I, I didn't have any personal experience to um, but I have interviewed a couple of folks that were around when polio was mm -hmm. you know quite quite an issue and uh, and how you know they were really worried about that in a similar way that you know people are worried about the virus now and so mm -hmm. It's because no idea to... how it was transmitted. That, that's the catch. You know, I think about HIV AIDS, too, because I lived through that decade. Um, but that, um, well, at the beginning of that, too, it's not knowing how it's transmitted and the fear that that puts between us. You know, reasonable fear, you know, good protocol fear. But still, I do worry about some of the xenophobia that's already coming up um, with Asian Americans, with you know, people of color with Hasidic Jews, with communities that are getting blamed for, I don't know, people from New Jersey. It's just incredible. Heaven forbid those people from New Jersey. They're really bad. you got to watch yeah, out for them. Now. Don't go anywhere without taking your license plate off first, okay? <laughs> So I, I hope we can keep an eye on that. I hope we can keep the compassion forward and have reasonable caution. But, but you know, when we don't know how things are spread, it's, it's uh, reasonable to be afraid, I guess. So I'd really like to uh, dive into one of your books a little bit because I think it's just so um, apropos at this point, learning to walk in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, for those who are not very familiar with that book, could you just give a brief synopsis? Yeah, I'll, almost all my books start out with a problem and it's often a Christian problem I have. And in, in that case, the Christian problem was 
summed up in first john i think five you know god is light and in him there is no darkness at all and i thought wait that's the same god who made day and night that's the same god who said days begin at sundown that that one the one who knows us from our wombs to our tombs is the one in whom there is no darkness at all and that just seemed wrong so <laughs> I, I dove into the book with all kinds of experiments you know a little exegesis going through the bible and realizing while darkness as a word is almost always terrible it's like evil ignorance death but the stories of what happens in the dark in the bible are amazing all the good stuff happens in the dark so it occurred to me darkness is really a great big piece of sticky paper for most people and it attracts everything they're afraid of it attracts the unknown it attracts the future it attracts illness and death and the loss of people we love and people have their own darkness folders and they put all kinds of things in there but i wanted to fatten my folder and so i did a lot of things in that book you know spent some time in a in a cave and um participate in an experiment being blind and wandered around for a, a, an hour or two with a, literally a blind guide who turned out to be extremely competent and helpful um, in that time. But but in the book, I, I, I did try to present the case that the dark is where God does most of God's best work uh, because our defenses are shot and our vulnerability is high and, and with any luck, our compassion's cranked up. So that's the case I try to make in that book and it um, <laughs> don't ever write a book with that title because right after that all kinds of terrible stuff happened and it was like the universe was saying oh really let's see how good you are at this darkness stuff <laughs> so I got some real hands-on practical experience in it but it held true and and as as briefly as I can put it um, the places I, I most need to go are the places I least want to go. And so I would never say that any loving deity makes me suffer. Um, it is in suffering that I am most easy to get to. And that seems to me really important in any relationship with that, which is bigger than me, you know, as vast as the universe. How did I ever think I could be in, in control of that? So, so that, that's the thesis of the book. And I had a great, a great lot of fun um, writing it and even more listening to people who read it and finding out what they were afraid of. The cave chapter gave them the absolute willies. Most people didn't think they could survive that, but they'll go sit in a closet. They're probably in closets right now on Zoom calls. So maybe we'll get over some of that now. Uh, so a moment ago, you mentioned, you know, some of the bad things that seem to be outgrowth of, you know, what we're going through as, you know, well as, you know, you mentioned some of the great things are. And um, I think, you know, my own experience is that, you know, times of stress, you know, times of darkness are ones that are pressure points to either bring out the best or bring out the worst. Mm -hmm. And sometimes and, both, right? On Monday, yeah. Tuesday, and Wednesday, it's one, and on Thursday, it flips to the other. So, and you know, and comes back. But right now, e you know, even to get very practical, this could be sensitive. But um, people I know who are buying guns, you know, who never thought they would buy guns, and that's really a scary thought. That that if things become scarce, I will have things that other people want, and they may come to get them, and I will have to shoot and kill them. That's just wow. Kind of a, yeah. Wow. So that and again, I live in a rural area. We're a, we're a Second Amendment um, sanctuary county, so I have wonderful hunter friends and people who own plenty of guns. So it's not about guns, but it's about guns uh, bought by people like me who are afraid. You don't want fearful people having guns, really, um, who don't know how to use them. So I, I look at that as a real stark reminder of where we could go if we don't um, in, encourage each other in some other ways. So, Barbara, one of the other books that you've written that I absolutely love that uh, I mentioned earlier is called Holy Envy, you know, basically what we can learn from other religions besides Christianity. So um, I'd love your thoughts on some of the things, experiences, things that you learned um, in, in researching those other um, religions and how that can help us now. Sure. And anybody listening to us may not know my exposure was because I was assigned to teach religions of the world at the college level and was not competent to do that. So I had to educate myself pretty quickly and then also continue to learn for the next 20 years as I took students to different places of study and worship in Atlanta. So that's the context for Holy Envy, uh, kind of a classroom memoir of what it was like for me, a Christian teacher, to be trusted to teach 
four other great religions of the world, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, um, and how I took that with huge Christian seriousness <laughs> to do unto others as I would have them do unto me and to present other faiths as best I could, their jewels, their beauties, um, as I would hope people would present the jewels and beauties of, of Christianity if they were not Christian, you know, but teaching that to people who um, either were very familiar or completely unfamiliar. So what I learned most of all was I couldn't hold a stereotype for through a whole field trip. <laughs> I could go anywhere in Atlanta and my stereotypes fell dead to the floor within minutes of walking through the door anywhere we went. Um, and granted, I chose places that were welcoming of students and teachers and, and wanted people to come learn more about them because they were all minority traditions in this country. You know, Christians, whether they go to church or active um, or not, this is a, a Christian-soaked country. So um, all the other places we went represented minority traditions. So they were happy to see us there. And so my stereotypes did not hold. Um, I found that truly, truly, and it's not my quote, but what we have most in common is not our religion, but our humanity. That our religions are subsets of our humanity. Our humanity is not a subset of our religion. So if the only people who are truly human are people who share my faith, I'm in a sad mess in terms of how many people in the world I just lost as kin. Um, so we could spend the whole rest of the time talking about ways I read scripture so that I, I um, don't feel as if I'm inventing my own. <laughs> sure, I'm inventing my religion. Aren't we all inventing our own religions all the time? <laughs> but what I found was it was a wonderful thing to talk to people of other traditions who would ask me questions about being Christian that no Christian had ever asked me. Like, could you go through that Trinity thing one more time? How is one three exactly? <laughs> And three one and and aren't you monotheistic so you know how is jesus god doesn't scripture say jesus is the son of god how does the son of god become god and i found myself reading early church history and doctrinal consultations and just to be able to answer people of goodwill of other traditions who are not attacking at all they're just curious they just didn't know you know why do you pray on your knees with your eyes closed why do you you know, do, do you do this? Do you do anything like meditation? Do you have anything like yoga? What are your big holidays? It was just so interesting to both ask questions, but also to be asked questions that no Christian ever asked because they took it for granted that we all knew what we meant when we said sin or forgiveness or redemption or salvation or but all of a sudden, people who didn't have that in their vocabularies, soul was so interesting because that's a big controversy in um, Buddhist teaching. Because the impermanence of everything is a central teaching. So the idea that there's some immortal soul that goes on and on and on is a great source of conversation with, you know, Buddhists of various schools. So anyhow, I learned a ton, not just about my neighbors, but also about my own tradition. And that shows up in Holy Indy. I also tried to write that for Christians, uh, oh, who have said to me so many times, I always thought that, but I didn't think I could ever say it, that I could learn about God from the faith of others. So I, I wanted also exactly. to give yeah, support to people who have always had that instinct, that God-given instinct about our kinship, you know, being about our flesh and bloodness um, and our life and our being and, and not our doctrines particularly. So, so it was um, a book that's still unfolding in terms of people still using it, reading it, and asking me questions. Most people wanted the Christianity quiz. They wanted me to send them the Christianity quiz from my class to see if they could pass it. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, the whole experience of just having an outsider ask you about these Christian mm -hmm. either traditions or beliefs mm -hmm. or what have you, that alone had mm -hmm. to be a great conversation. Yeah, it was. It was. And I don't have any way really to pursue that in person where I live now, though I could do it this way, I suppose. So, you know, Habersham County is, is pretty Western European. And well, that's not entirely true. There's, there's a lot more diversity everywhere than most of us notice because we only see what we expect to see. So I take back what I said. I live in a county of 40,000 people with large Southeast Asian, African American, and Central American populations. So there's a lot of diversity here. But, you know, kind of, we often don't take the time to have the kind of conversations that mm -hmm. reveal, you know, the kinds of things that we really should be talking about. Yeah. 
Yeah, and sometimes it's as interesting as, you know, I told students, if you go to a Thai restaurant, because we've got one in town, and there's a Buddha at the cash register, why don't you ask somebody? You know, why don't you ask the person at the cash register uh, wh about that? What's wonderful is you can find people are just as ignorant of their own traditions as I am of mine. So it's really fun sometimes to have people say, gosh, you know more about X, Y, or Z than I do, because they've not studied their religions academically. You know, they... They don't have the correct definition of how the Buddha is to be regarded, you know, like I did in a textbook. So anyhow, you're right. It's great fun. You can tell I could go on and on. <laughs> well, you know, it strikes me, you know, within our society that we don't know how to talk well about certain subjects. Um, and, uh, you know, talking about religion amongst people that are not part of our same church or whatever is one of those. Um, in, in a corporate environment, you know, I was taught that there were basically three things that you don't talk about, sex, politics, and religion. Like these days, <laughs> you're, you're going to be talking about sex and politics a lot if you live in this world, but go ahead. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can still avoid religion, but I don't know. No, I mean, it, but, you know, it's just like they were too, um, I, I don't know, too many opportunities for confrontation, I guess, or something, you know, like that, that, um, uh, just in, in a corporate environment, those were kind of off limits. You didn't want to talk about that. And I think as a result, you know, we as a society don't know how to talk about politics very similarly. You know, we don't need, know how to talk about religions amongst or between different religions very well. Yeah, and, and I want to tap that point you just made, which is Christian-Christian inter-religious dialogue is often much more difficult than you know, intra is more difficult than inter. You know, for Christians to sit down and talk about what they don't agree on, watch out. I mean, I'd rather go to lunch with a Dalai Lama than an Episcopalian who disagrees with me. So you, know, that, <laughs> that, that you, you came really close to a true, a true thing there. We don't even know how to talk to each other, right? That's very true. That's very true. And I know personally, I've never met a person that I agree 100% with, uh, you know, in no. terms of every single religion or political precepts. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. so Barbara, as you know, we have plenty of writers in our audience, and um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of writing now versus a typical day. Mm -hmm. Here's what I've noticed. When I finish a book, I finished one March a year ago. I usually say, that's it. I'm never doing that again. That was horrible. That was the most unpleasant experience. And then about a year later, I guess this is why people have two children, right? You have one child and go, never again. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and then later you say, oh, maybe once more. But, but I really thought I was finished. Um, I live at home with one other person, and I'm unemployed, e.g. retired. And I don't have small children here. So what I have found is a blossoming of um, time to read and write and take notes and start thinking about the next thing I, I want to write. If anything, it's this huge confirmation of what I al always suspected, which was the kind of writing I want to do takes a deep sinking down into quiet and stillness and a frame of mind and early mornings and late nights. And that has not been available to me, even in the three years since I've been retired from teaching. I've stayed on the fastest merry-go-round in the world. Um, and now I'm, I've been flung off it. So for me, at least, it's been a hugely rich time. And I also am very clear in writing, I don't want to waste anybody's time because our time is so valuable. I, I have found that it's a, a a time to think seriously about writing, that if, if writing is not wholeheartedly meant to be helpful to other people in some way, and fiction totally qualifies, so does poetry, so does nonfiction, so every kind of writing. But I just don't want to be a frivolous writer. I don't want to, I don't want to waste time. So many people probably do not know, Barbara, that you actually wrote a children's book. <laughs> You're not known exactly for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, both, you know, that experience, as well as uh, your views on the importance of reading to children in this kind of environment. Yeah, it was not my idea, but it ended up taking me places I loved going. It was an editor's idea who had read a sermon that was written for Christmas or uh, Epiphany and had thought the story of the three wise men would make a good children's book. So with his encouragement, I did that. And what I loved the most was thousand words down to a couple 
is going right for the essence, thinking very much about a childlike imagination, because adults can have that too, um, and going for rich imagery in language, no long words, you know, simplest way to an interesting point. I still think it was a book for 12 year olds, perhaps. I don't think I'd go well younger than that. But the most wonderful thing was working with an illustrator whom I never met named Melanie Cataldo. I was shown illustrations by a number of people and I chose her and she illustrated the book so beautifully that when I went to do readings with it, people would sometimes ask me questions about why I decided to make King Herod look the way I did. And I said, that wasn't me. <laughs> that was the but it was, so, it must be how a playwright feels to see actors take a script and put it on stage and give it its own life because she did things with a story that I had not imagined. So that kind of collaboration was wonderful. Um, and so were the parents and children who came to the readings. It was really wonderful to ask a few children to come up and stand around me and turn the pages while, while I read the story. So I, I don't know that I have it in me ever to do another, but it sure did remind me how many people have small children, how many of our ideas about ourselves and the world and God take shape when we're young and how much images the illustrations have to do with the way that settles in our minds. I remember when I was young, Maxfield Parrish was a kind of 1920s artist, and he illustrated books in ways that planted those images in my mind forever. I can call them up right now, and they got in when I was four or five years old. So I've never been more aware of the importance of children's books, especially about religious subjects, you know, books that, that encourage imagination and 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 ask children to wonder about the things they already wonder about and sanctify that wondering in, in a children's book. So so I love the experience. I don't think I am a children's book writer, but, but the same editor thinks he sees one more children's book <laughs> in another sermon. So maybe he'll talk me into trying it one more time. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, the world can do nothing but benefit by more books from Barbara Brown Taylor. And that certainly includes children, not just adults. Uh, yeah, children's books, if I think about it, and it depends on which one, it, they're like poetry. And I find poetry right now is hugely meaningful to me because it's sparse. I mean, it feels like the times. It's sparse and, and it gets right to the point. And, and most of the poetry I'm reading is a page long, you know, a couple of pages. And it's just, it, it's wonderful stuff. So children's books fall in that category for me. The ones that are for younger readers don't have a lot of words, but every word counts. So, of course, the next question that begs for me is whether or not you're going to come out with some poetry of your own. I wish. You know, I always thought this will be the time, won't it? Like, if I have all this time on my hands and I can't produce anything. I was turned down for a recent application to a Master in Fine Arts program in poetry, so that was probably the handwriting on the wall. Nah, <laughs> no, no white-haired women in their late 60s. We know you're just looking for a new hobby. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that would be a, doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it would do, it's a whole different voice, and it does seem to me this would be a time to fool around with that, but not with the idea of publication. I would, I would fool around with poetry for, for my own purposes. So no, you will not see a book of poetry. I think there are a lot of people who have that covered pretty well. <laughs> so Barbara, both uh, you and I do a lot of things in person and um, some things like this we do online. And so uh, let's talk for just a little bit about um, the differences, you know, what kinds of things we think we can do in online versus in person. Um, and, you know, kind of what all it means that we should listen to right now. Yeah. This is where I become hopelessly Christian because I am such an incarnationalist. I want to be in the room with people. I want to breathe the air they're breathing. I want to know how they smell today. I, I want to hear their stomachs growl. So, so this format is what we're doing because we can't do that. And it's got great virtues. It increases the diversity of people I can talk to and hear from, but this is always second choice for me. Though I'll tell you what, I'll be doing this a lot more in the future, strictly for environmental reasons. It doesn't make any sense. If I've gotten one thing out of this, and I've gotten many things out of this pandemic, is the, the carbon footprint. You know, just the huge 
smear of oil <laughs> I leave on the world through my travel. So, so this is a, a really viable way to be able to be in touch with people and, and not be always in the room, but it's, it still will always feel like second choice for me. So, so there's that. And, and the other thing that you and I have talked about is um, rescheduling everything that was canceled in the spring and cramming it all into the fall. And if there's a canceled conference, let's figure out how to do it online. And last week we watched clergy and lay people from all kinds of denominations, you know, try to replicate Easter services online. And it's a valiant effort. And then, and then at some point it begins to look to me like a desperate effort to act as if nothing has changed or to act as if we can paper over this, we can make up for this later, or we can go into hyperactivity and still comfort and console. And I have found myself reluctant um, to be, to have my scared places filled in too fast or to have my lonely places filled in too fast. It has seemed hugely important to me to let the gravity of what's happening sink in and the beauty of what's happening sink in and the deprivation of what's happening sink in to, to let this virus have its way with me. I do, don't want to get it, but it could happen to me. And in that case, I go back to what I said earlier in the interview. Could I then rise to that? Could I find a way to live fully while I'm dying? And it has come to that. I'm married to somebody many years my senior. He's 82. He's just in the prime, you know, the prime age group to be affected um, terribly by this. But um, it just seems important to me to not dismiss the seriousness or the beauty of, of what's happening. So I don't want my time filled up and I don't want to reschedule everything and I don't want to replicate the things that are being canceled. I want to do what I can when I can, but then I want to sit still. I want to come to a standstill. Um, if I work on a new book, that'll be the title of it, Stand Still, Stand Still, and see what standing still you know, has to teach about God's way with me and other people. So that circles back to the beginning of our conversation. But you are someone I will talk to on Zoom anytime. So, <laughs> well, well, thank you for previewing your next book for us. That's really uh... <laughs> and no one listening can steal that title. That <laughs> Stand still. But yes, I mean uh, we've had several conversations uh, between us about, you know, what do we try to replicate online and what do we not? And, you know, just the, the technology that we have just to have this conversation is so superior to anything that existed, you know, even just a few years ago and the rest of the history of mankind. So it brings an awful lot to us. However, it doesn't bring everything to us. And, and as you said, I mean, um, some of the wonderful experiences that we've had doing our conferences together um, in person, just can't be replicated. Cannot, cannot. And, and truly, um, I hope you leave this in the interview. You do such a beautiful job with writing for your life, the kinds of people you bring in, and then the kind of people who are attracted to the kinds of people you bring in. It, it is the, I don't even know the word for it, the sweetest conference in terms of the heart, you know, the, the, the depth of heart and kindness that people bring to writing for your life. I lay at your feet. It's a beautiful thing you're doing. So thanks for inviting me to be part of it. Well, Barbara, as usual, you're way too gracious and generous. But um, the people that I invite are people like you. And the people who make the conferences great are people like you. And, uh, you know, I've been very blessed, you know, to be able to have incredible speakers uh, and incredible attendees, you know, that have come to these. And we've both, you know, gotten such a tremendous amount from the folks that we've met that attended you know, our conferences that we've now built relationships with. And so uh, that's just a, a, a huge blessing, I know, for me. Me too. Barbara, I just want to say thank you for joining us. This has just been a wonderful time spent together. Uh, we, we get to spend more time uh, having a great conversation now than we typically do when we're in person. And uh, so that is one of the advantages of, uh, <laughs> of, of having this time. But I, I just want to say thank you. I know that, you know, an online conversation isn't necessarily your uh, favorite, you know, um, way to communicate, but I've uh, enjoyed it tremendously, and I want to thank you for that. I as well. Thank you, Brian. Take care. <laughs>